Hey, quick side note. We originally recorded this episode slap bang in the middle of 2020 during the COVID pandemic because the intent was for it to coincide with The Forever Purge. That film was, of course, delayed for over a year, and so this episode was delayed in turn. For over a year, it sat on a shelf. Well, uh, our Patreon, actually. It's been available for early access there as is our upcoming Kingsman 2 episode, much the same thing, recorded last year. Patreon.com forward slash Dim Returns. Get access to that right now if you want, for as little as £1 a month. Anyway, uh, The Forever Purge is finally coming out, apparently. Now the world's getting back to normal, so just take that context on board. There is an NHS clapping joke right up front, for example. It's a time capsule. Enjoy! This is not a test. This is your emergency podcast system announcing the commencement of the annual Diminishing Returns Purge podcast <laughs> sanctioned by the UK government. Commencing at the siren, <laughs> any and all comments, including negative, will be legal for... Ooh, pro- this one's going to be about an hour and a half when it's edited, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah, about an hour and a half. Okay. Comments above type four. Ooh, uh... <laughs> uh, all other comments are restricted. <laughs> I... <laughs> So today we're talking about The Purge. Uh, I'm Calvin, and with me are Alan. Hello. And Sol. Ooh, happy Purge. (laughs) Have you guys got your blue flowers out on the lawn? Uh, no, but I, I'll be I'll be clapping for the purge in uh, <laughs> six minutes' time. <laughs> Obviously, uh, we're talking about the series. I think everyone knows the basic premise of this. The whole idea is that this is set in an alternate reality where the United States has brought in this this sort of special day, really, in March, where any and all crime is legal for a period of twelve hours. And obviously, these films mainly focus on the murder side of those crimes. Yeah. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, let's I wanted to talk about that as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just wanted to sort of uh kick off things perhaps by saying if uh if there was a real life purge, <laughs> what do you think your what would be guys' the most obvious response question to ask be? on this podcast? Uh, <laughs> I would uh I'd open up uTorrent and I would go to town downloading the like gigabytes of, of movies and like just having them for the rest of the year. Like difficult to find films hmm. or films that I didn't want to pay for but we were gonna do on the podcast. <laughs> and beyond that I don't really know. I, I might um I mean I'll tell you what I would do if I was in a position to do so is a little bit of insider trading. Hmm. Bit of uh pissing about with the stock market. I'd be all over that. I think everyone would. I think they just wait until purge day and then they do all their illegal trading. That's, that's why they do it at night. But surely insider trading is more about sharing information than. Well, I don't know. Well, this is this is an interesting question, uh, which I thought might take us longer to get into. But the pedantry of the rules, um, <laughs> <laughs> which I'm sure Saul is going to want to talk about, but I do as well. If you commit a crime during the purge, but you've done something prior to the time of the purge. So, for example, if you've prepared to kill someone, i.e. made a plan, bought a weapon, anything that could be, say... Well, that's illegal. That's conspiracy conspiracy to murder. Mm. So that's still a crime that you could be put in prison for many years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's illegal. I would imagine that there's something written into the laws in this film that they don't go... In this these films that they don't go into that... But you're right. It, it, it's... Yeah. Because there's all sorts of ramifications of that. I mean, I guess... The the sort of problem with these films are if you try and take them too much on face value, you're going to fall down very quickly. You've got to kind of take it just, okay, look, this is the world we're in. These are the rules. It just go with it. It's we're on, that's not to kind of get too far ahead here, but as we went along the four films, the more I saw of it, the more I understood of it, the less able I was to hold on to that. You know. Hmm. No, that's interesting. Really? As the franchise goes on the more you see of it, the more they begin to flirt with exploring the premise beyond everyone's gonna kill everyone. Oh my god. 
Mm. Well, to be honest, the the actual purge itself, I think, in the first film feels almost like an afterthought. I haven't looked into any of the behind the scenes stuff on this, but it feels like the the story is about this this well off family, and they take in um, a person who they don't know, and there are people outside their house wanting to get in mm. and kill that guy. Yeah, and it's a it's a classic home invasion movie setup. Yeah, but it 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 feels like. Whoever, like James DeMonaco, I guess, yeah, is, is the, the brain behind all of this. The man who's written and yeah. directed, in some cases, the entire franchise to date, I think. I think he directed all except for the last one, which yeah. is annoyingly called The First Purge. So this is going to be a, <laughs> a fun discussion. Uh, but I I, I, fe- I feel like he wanted to do, for that first movie, he wanted to do that home invasion story. And then sort of was writing that and then was sort of figuring out like, okay, well, how do I do this? What is the thing? Aha, it's this purge. See, I, I, I think my instinct when I watch it and look at the series as the exact opposite, I think he had this outstanding idea for just a core premise in a film. And I, I'm just going to lay my cards out right now. I think the premise of these films, silly as it is, is just mm. brilliant. Mm. It's an absolute stroke of genius from a from a trashy horror filmmaker point of view. Um, mm. I think he had that idea and then just thought, right, well, how can we do that on this minute budget <laughs> that will only yeah, allow for like one interior <laughs> and like a cast of about four people <laughs> that that is my guess particularly given how much they kind of open up the franchise with the sequels and start going mm. outdoors and so on yeah how much they really embrace the social ideas behind it all and uh i'll be honest with you i'm i'm really su- surprised this happens every now and then but i'm genuinely surprised that such an anti-American film is made and released and then is successful in America. Hmm. I'm not quite sure. Because I I don't think it's particularly... Maybe in the first film, but in the later films, the second one, it's pretty much just saying, look, we need to go and kill the 1%. And reclaim yeah. our country. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's pretty right. Um, I, I was um, astonished that three of these were released before Trump. I I couldn't believe this. This particular oh God, um, Im- imagery in the third one. We'll get there, I suppose. But there's this one bit where these uh, guys are going out purging, and they've got these like flaming torches. And I was like, oh wow, they're evoking that the whole Charlottesville, the the uh, racists yeah. protesting there. They're evoking that imagery. And then I looked at the released. I was like, oh my God, it happened. <laughs> this film was like released. A year and a half before all that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Cuts it fine. Yeah, I, I um before we before we dig into any specifics here, um I just like to give a little shout out to Mark Rogers, our Patreon subscriber. Yeah. Um, who we we did a, a little request on our Patreon account a while back, uh, quite recently, just saying for people to pitch us ideas for episodes to cover. And um, we ultimately went with Hamlet, as you will already know, if you are a subscriber who listens through everything we do. But another suggestion we got was from Mark Rogers to do The Purge. And the reason we didn't select that is pretty much because there's a new film coming out, which... um, I mean, that's something else we should probably address. <laughs> um, we, we we started... We had this on our dock to to coincide with the release of the new Purge movie, The Forever Purge, which was quietly delayed indefinitely, along with most of the 2020 uh, release schedule. But they held on to the release date they had for so long that it got to a point where we had started re-watching the series, or watching for the first time in some cases, and rather than wait another six or however many months for the film to come out, having forgotten everything, we thought, we'll just record it now, stick it on a shelf, and and release it whenever. So, Much like the film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So who knows when you're listening to this. Mm. So if you're a Patreon subscriber, you will probably have heard this roughly around the time it would have gone out anyway, originally. If you are not, then hey, you should have got on Patreon. You could have heard this months ago, mm. <laughs> before before society completely fell apart. Mm. Well, that's it. I mean, as we record this, we're still in the midst of Black Lives Matter protests, um, kind of still in the heart of that. And it's impossible not to evoke that when watching these films. And again, it's it's kind of like, it's hard to believe these are made before all that. These feel like films that are going to be made in the next five years. 
evoking mm. those feelings, mm. kind of that sense of you know violent protest and, and riots and, and all that sort of stuff, and how the government handles that, how it spins it. Jason Blum, he's a he's a he's prescient. He is is he did the same thing with Unfriended. Have you seen Unfriended and Unfriended Two? No. no. They they practically predicted social distancing Zoom meeting parties. A ghost kills everyone over Skype. <laughs> Okay. Well, the f- the first one is definitely about financial inequity, as in, look, hey, look, we've got the yeah. best security systems money can buy, so we're all right. The fact that the guy who's on the run is a black guy, and the the young like wankers who are chasing him are like posh twat white folk, is definitely not an accident. It doesn't really play into the racism. In fact, even the later films, it's never directly playing into the racism angle, but it's obviously there. Mm, uh, yeah. and, and the casting uh, will, uh, generally will display that as well. Is the first one set in Staten Island? No. No? Just because everything James DeMonaco touches seems to be set <laughs> in Staten Island, I realised the other day. He's probably from mm. Staten Island, they love it over there. If you look now uh, on his IMDb, he has a film coming out that was due for release this year called Once Upon a Time in Staten Island. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But about ten years ago, he released a film that was just called Staten Island. <laughs> mm. And I can tell you the Purge TV series, season one, is set in Staten Island. Mm-hmm. It's been a week or two since I watched the, the first Purge, but am the I right in thinking film, that? The, yeah, the experiment, yep. the first Purge. Am I right in thinking the experiment takes place on Staten Island? Because yeah. they can kind yep. of shut it off. Yeah, Which so just kind of makes a... sense, because it's an island also... It's yeah, uh, yeah, it's yeah. got a lot of poor people. <laughs> sort of the shithole of New York. The first one is very much set in a fancy Los Angeles suburb, though it's definitely West right, Coast. Right. Okay. Um. I I guess maybe that was financial. Maybe they couldn't. I I'm assuming Blumhouse is uh California based and keep budgets down. I think so. Yeah. 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 Plus, you know, Ethan Hawke. You got a. You got a fly him out to set so well yeah i mean i was i was gonna say they don't they don't have bad leads ethan hawk and lena Headey, who are uh, both known actors yeah yeah in the first one yeah are we are we diving into the first one Shall not we? the first purge the actual first <laughs> film the purge yeah, yeah. 2013 <laughs> um do you do you remember when this came out? I I remember the marketing back in 2013 and the marketing was pretty much just here's the premise of this film. Good, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and I and I remember thinking like, oh that is a cool idea for a film actually. Mm. I will have to check that out. But there was a real a real backlash initially, I remember from people just being like what a fucking dumb idea for a film. That's so stupid. Oh, really? I mean that's basically what I thought up until when I watched the film. Yeah. Yeah. And it's actually handled a lot better. <laughs> it's a great idea, just just on the face of it, as a logline for a film. That is, that is, you know, I I, I don't think we've done a film on this show with such a good premise since it follows. Mm. Yeah, but my the problem is that my preconception was going to be, oh, it's just going to be like a kind of slasher, get in there, gore kind of film. That's what I was hoping for. <laughs> well, that's not what I was hoping for. It's what I was expecting. <laughs> but obviously it's a lot mm. classier than that. Well, there's a lot of stuff, like a lot of the promotional material around the around the time and the trailers and the posters and stuff, they'd all made the thing was like, oh, these creepy people in these masks trying to get into your home. And yeah. that is a that is a part of the film, obviously, but it's not really about that. And a lot of the stuff that was yeah. in the trailer is actually just from a short montage that takes place about yeah. half an hour in. Yeah, it feels like it's just a visual thing. Like they did the same with Pet Cemetery, didn't they? They have this whole bit where the kids are wearing creepy masks and it's completely irrelevant to the film. But they use it in the trailer. Again, that was um the marketing team, I remember reading an interview with the directors of that film where they said like, oh yeah, we just put this one little scene in where these kids went through with masks on. We just thought that's a nice little thing. And then the the film's marketing team hmm. came along to set that day and just took the kids away and were filming with them for hours getting all this like additional <laughs> publicity stuff. Yeah. And it's like, oh, I guess they just know what, what looks good on a poster, do they? It's probably what they did here. Mm. But this is this does play into one of the interesting ideas behind all this. So if if there are no legal consequences to your actions, it doesn't mean there are no societal consequences or moral consequences. You know, if you yeah. go kill someone, your neighbours see you do it, they're still going to judge you for that, or in whatever way. And I feel like that never gets addressed in these films, like the mm. consequences. Oh, it in does. That sense. It does. It does. 
Maybe it's because I've been watching the TV show. Have you guys not seen the TV series? No. I, Am I the only one? Well, well, well. Mm, I've I've seen half of it. We'll get to why I haven't <laughs> seen all of it later on. They do flirt with these things. I think this is what's very frustrating with this franchise is they're constantly flirting with addressing all the things that yeah. you kind of want them to get into. But they, like, you're right, they never really. I want a full film of just the day after the purge where you just watch, you know, <laughs> the bin men come and do clean up and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> oh, could you believe that? Oh, another bloody hand in this dumpster for fuck's sake. <laughs> but now I know what you mean because certainly here it's presented as like you're either a psychopath and going out killing people or you're a normal human being <laughs> who wants to stay in with yeah. their family. And later on, I think, well, we'll get to it later on, but here yeah. certainly it's, you know, Lena Headey, there's that scene up front with her neighbor who has these cookies and she's like, oh, you have your flowers out. Good. And she's just this creepy sort of. Stepford. Horrible neighbor. Yeah, neighbors. Stepford yeah. wife, perfect. But they all yeah. are. Like in those opening scenes where they're interacting with the neighbors and stuff, it's just like you immediately get a creepy vibe. Yeah. And yeah. I think perhaps that. So that means all I was thinking was the whole time was like, oh, well, the neighbors are going to be up to something. Mm. But I think that must be necessary because ultimately the neighbors turn up at the end with no kind of precursor at all. So unless you have yeah. that bit of creepiness, you'd be just like, where have these guys come from? What's that about? Yeah. And yeah, very true. Yeah. That's what I think interesting what you said there uh, earlier, Calvin, about this feels like he had a home invasion script and then kind of slapped a gimmick on it. Because mm. that whole ending with the neighbors bit feels very just slapped on. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. Um, like I said, I, I think, like Sol said, really, home invasion films were quite the rage at this point, like a bunch of people and people trying to get inside. And I guess this was a different... I, I, I basically, I just think that the premise wasn't thought through much at this stage. And I think later yeah, on, they kind yeah. of rolled with it a bit more and yeah. uh, evolved it. Whereas here it is just a family in a not very big house. And yet they make it seem like it's this like catacomb sort of thing like <laughs> it's just mum and dad and they've got two kids and the girl has a boyfriend over and then he's out to kill the dad at one point and people will like like the daughter goes running off in one scene and then they're like oh my god where's she gone we need to find her and it's like the house is not that big just go <laughs> to one of the bed she'll be in a bedroom probably or one of the bathrooms just go have a look it can't be it can't be that small can it they've got like a whole sort of room of security equipment i i've just looked on imdb's trivia here Mm. And uh, the the director was asked why the majority of the film is set indoors when it opens with footage of outdoor purging, mm. and his response was, "We only had 19 days to shoot and a 2.7 million dollar budget." Mm. Yeah, <laughs> so mm. makes sense. So, um, That's good. yeah, it does make sound it like it was right. more work of a the limits. You work make, with... make it look good. Yeah. But do they work with... I mean, obviously they, they, I mean, they, they've released a film that's feature length, but God, I mean, half of this is just <laughs> the family, like, wandering around in the dark with torches, be like, Whoa! and, it, like, the, the guy who's in there with them, the, the homeless guy that they take in, the, the young boy lets him in, um, I know that he's not gonna kill them, because that's not how this is gonna go, so it, it I, I'm just completely suspenseless throughout so much of that, with the family trying to find the guy, because I know he's not a bad guy. No, I see, I I um, I um, did find this first film very suspenseful, I don't think that's a good word, and ultimately kind of frustrated with the anticlimactic nature of the ending, I think, mm. but mm. The, I felt like I was trying to figure out what was going on the whole time, and yeah, the so the guy... The guy they take in, you're saying, oh, he's definitely not going to kill them. But mm. I I was seeing this as, like, they might kill him. Like, this point of the story was, like, th are this family, and particularly the dad, hmm. what, like, what... What would what would it take to push you to murder? It's like that kind of idea. Well, if you threaten my family, I guess I would do it. But ultimately, mm. he's an innocent. Will you give up an innocent to save your family? Well, mm. yeah. do you know what? Yeah, and he, the guy says, I understand if you would do that. But and mm. and so that was kind of like the whole thing. Is he going to do that? Is he going to do that? To be honest with you, like the 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 smug twats outside were a bit of a distraction. Like yeah. that. Would, <laughs> but obviously, they needed a threat. They needed a reason why this guy was, you know, a, a kind of an external mm. threat. Um, mm. But yeah, and ultimately, it it felt a bit yeah like it didn't quite pay off. One of those suspense. Mm -hmm. And and there's some things that really don't pay off, some really weird things, like the boyfriend, 
who mm. snuck over there for the yeah. purge. And he's like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm just going to hang out. And then he pulls a bloody gun out. And he's going to shoot his girlfriend's dad because he thinks that's going to prove that he's a good mm. boyfriend somehow. <laughs> and, like, we just haven't had enough backstory to deal with that. <laughs> like, And, and mm. then, you know, you sort of see him get killed. Or you see him get shot. But then that's happening at the exact same time as the other inciting incident where they let this guy in. And so it's all this massive confusion. And it's like, well, that boyfriend's definitely going to be, like, is the boyfriend a mole for the neighbours because they're going to come round at some mm-hmm. point? And then the boyfriend, the thing never goes anywhere. I thought it was no. at least they were going to turn around and he'd gone and like he wasn't really dead. Yeah, and then he like was going how... to come out. That just went nowhere. It was so... And then, plus also, it never... because they're dealing with something else, they never address that on an emotional level either. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. Even the daughter yeah. character, you might think, have some guilt about that, seems to never even address it. Yeah. Very odd thing, that. That felt like it was an early draft thing and they forgot to take it out. After they yeah. change the ending or something. The only th- the only thing it does is, I guess, if you're like me and you think that this is going to be more of a slasher film with a body count, it does yeah. give you a kill early on because there's not going to be another one until really the end. But uh, but I agree, it is completely shoehorned in. Whether it's for that purpose or not, I don't know. But even but... if it was the only thing you got out of it was that the dad realised that he could kill. Right. Okay, that is self-defence, certainly. But... Perhaps that gives him this guy, oh my god, I've taken a life. Like, I, Yeah, and so when it comes to do it again, he's like, well, fuck yeah, I can do this. But you don't get yeah. any sense of that from even from character, never mind plot. I think Calvin's absolutely right that it was probably just put in there so they could have a, a guy die. <laughs> um, so he wouldn't get bored. <laughs> but I also think, Alan, you, you should have done a pass over the script because you, know, you, you found a way to make it... <laughs> <laughs> fit into the script far I think more that's so organically. often when I watch films. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I must say, it's been such a long time since then. I guess this is a, a testament to the good premise, really, but I've not seen, like, a God, even a series of films in so long where it's like, oh, but you could have done this, and you could have done that, and why didn't you do this? Yeah. It's like, I kept thinking that the cookies that the neighbour brought over were going to be some kind of a plot point, and it was like, <laughs> yeah. as if they were going to be poisoned or something. <laughs> yeah, or sleeping. Co- I thought that well, that might be a twist at the end like aha you've eaten that and now but no it's just so many missed opportunities so i i I watched this film probably back in like 2014 or something i didn't see it at the cinema but i i did see it roughly when it came out had you guys seen this before or is this no No, i haven't watched them at all until last week interesting Hmm. and uh ethan hawk dies in it which i yeah surprised at I was really surprised when I rewatched it because I I didn't even I remembered him living through to the end. I I I I think I had it in my head that he might even come back in a sequel or something. So mm. actually, apparently he does pop up in season two of the TV show, but I haven't seen that. Yeah, I read that. Uh, yeah. But yeah, it just ends up being Lena Headey, and the ending really does just sort of peter out it's this really strange like because they get rid of all the outsiders initially trying to get in and then the neighbors come in and then they sort of apprehend them and then they just sort of awkwardly sit around a table until the sirens go off and it's like oh well right goodbye and Mm. then that's just sort of it it's really strange which i i sort of like because that feels like that's kind of the realistic consequence like somebody died and then they're all gonna have to live with this but then yeah, again, it I, just I like agree. it feels like I want to deal with those consequences then, or, or at <laughs> least sort of have some sense of it. But yeah, I mean, ultimately, yeah. what happens is she has the opportunity to avenge the death of her husband, and she was like, "No, no more killing. This is silly." Mm. And next year, they're gonna come over and kill her. Yeah, I suspect they may move house. I mean, it's just. <laughs> it's just me, but... <laughs> I don't really have that much to say about this first one beyond the core premise, really. I think I think they had this fantastic idea for a film, not a great deal of resources to really make use of it, and the end result is kind of a wasted promise. It's it's kind of like yeah, yeah. I I think that sums it up completely. It's it's such a wasted sort of thing. I couldn't believe that half the movie was just them fumbling around in the dark with torches and it. Yeah. Oh, I, you you say that, but I I, I was I was engrossed by the film. I was engaged. Like I said, I I got quite into a, like trying to figure out what was going to happen. I will say Calvin made me watch a number of home invasion movies while at uni. It's not a genre that I really go in for typically. And don't say this is one of the better ones. <laughs> oh, it absolutely is. I mean, I've not seen many. I don't think I've seen any that really jumped to mind as being great. 
I'd say this is one of the more interesting ones, definitely. It has a good premise. Yeah, if I had to, if if I had to rewatch any of them, I'd I'd certainly take this over. I don't know Mother's Day or whatever. <laughs> You made me watch it, you know. Yeah, I did make you watch Mother's Day. But like The Strangers <laughs> or Don't Breathe. Oh, Don't Breathe is amazing. Does that count as home invasion? I well, it's know. they're invading a home. Yeah, I don't know. But you're, you, the protagonists are the ones doing the invasion and that. Is that the same? Well, I, I think it is. Uh, I've not seen the first uh, The Strangers, but I have seen the second one. There's a second one? <laughs> yeah. Oh. But it's not so much a home invasion, it's more of a straight down the line slasher movie, the second one, because it's set in like a campsite or a trailer park or something. Hmm. Um, no, I I think, uh, maybe just in my mind, the idea of the home invasion film, I, I've seen much better home invasion films, much scarier, more suspenseful home invasion films than this. The Purge itself is a really good concept, but I just, I, you mm. to explore that properly, you have to get outside of this constraint and that's what they do in the next films i i agree it's not a particularly scary or tense film so if that's what you're here for then yeah there, there are much better examples out there but when i when i first watched this film way back when i i gave it a six out of ten hmm. uh upon re-watching it i've dropped that down to a five because i realized it's it's like a five out of ten movie for me, hmm. and even that five's quite generous. But an extra point was for the premise. Hmm. But I don't know. I kind of feel like the premise has transcended that one film now, so I don't need to give it that extra point anymore. Hmm. <laughs> uh, I'll go next then. It's a four from me. Uh, I just I I, I didn't enjoy the I, I it is just the concept is really good and there was so much like good setup and stuff but ultimately it just fizzles out and I just don't think that that concept gels that well with the kind of horror film that they're trying to do here and they need to get out of this house and they do that thankfully in yeah. the next film so four out of ten from me I had low expectations of this because I pretty much expected it to be like, a, oh, we're going to kick your door in and kill you kind of film. <laughs> so the fact that they had any premise at all beyond that impressed me. Like I said, I enjoyed the the journey. Ultimately, I felt frustrated at the end of it all. It was kind of anticlimactic. But then I will say, having watched the others and seen that premise extended helps me appreciate that film more, I think, uh, rather than feeling frustrated by it. Anyway, all that said, I gave it a 7 out of 10. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. Not not often I'm the voice of... Uh, <laughs> Jesus, yeah. Uh, positivity on yeah. this <laughs> So, I mean, they, they followed it up very, very swiftly. The following year, we got The Purge Anarchy. And I, I did go to the cinema to see this one off the back of um, the premise and sort of thinking like, oh, cool, they're actually going to deliver on the promise of that first film now they've made some money with it, I imagine. That's cool. So, The Purge Anarchy. Hmm. A far more interesting set up i guess in that it's a bunch of interconnecting characters yeah. i think is sort of the premise so in reality they all kind of convene quite early on and just try and make their way through um the streets yeah i mean they start off giving us these sort of separate stories and i made a note like they better bring these together if this is like an anthology film it's gonna be very annoying so, <laughs> but they do actually very quickly bring them all together so it's like okay that's but, i mean i i'd I'd love a proper Purge anthology film where, you know, I'd want it to all come together a bit, but I'd be well up for a Purge movie where they don't all interact and meet up until, like, the last 20 minutes. Mm. It'd have to. I, I think there's a lot of... Mm, it'd have to work, though, yeah. Mm. Yeah, but I think there's a lot of scope in that universe to do... Sounds like a TV little... series. Vignettes. Yeah, but then, well, we'll talk about it. <laughs> yeah, we'll get there. <laughs> This, it's, the whole idea seems to be based on a false premise that, well, first of all, if people have the opportunity to purge, then they won't commit crime the rest of the year, which I think is total nonsense anyway. But also that if crime has gone down because of that, poverty will also reduce. And I don't know where that linear point comes from. That doesn't make any sense at all. Yeah, it's the other way around, isn't it? <laughs> um I, 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 The first point, the film franchise kind of gets into that itself. Yeah, I'll forgive yeah. it for that. There's a lot of problems I have with this premise, and I have to kind of just throw my hands up and let them have it. Yeah, because by I the time they get to the, the third and fourth mostly. movie, they start um, <laughs> directly addressing them. Yeah, I think you have to take it in some sense as an analogy. 
and like I say, as they develop yeah, this yeah, more and more, and an idea of basically it's just examining the inequity of America and the kind of yeah, uh, completely, and, and that sort of stuff. And and so you've got to kind of take it, you know, it's it's a hyper hyper realized idea of something we're showing exactly, you. exactly. I might be not remembering, but am I the only one who said what I'd do if if purging was allowed if if uh, all crime was legal you guys didn't get into it i didn't want to I, uh... th- I think we should go through with each film I, alan i think you should tell us what you do well obviously i'm not going to answer this honestly so <laughs> I was... oh dear <laughs> i'll kill myself <laughs> i don't know I, there's no one like i don't it's not illegal anymore is it i think they've got rid of the the legislation surrounding that. <laughs> There's no one I want to kill, as in someone I know personally. If I was going to kill someone, it would be maybe not like a random stranger. It would probably be just someone who annoyed me. I would wait, like the day before, I'd just wait out on the street and I'd wait until someone, like, oh, throw some litter or spits in the street. <laughs> and I'm just like, right, follow them, find out where they live. I'll get them tomorrow night. <laughs> so I mean, you actually, you actually full on would just be a character in one of these films. <laughs> in fact, there is some, there is a character in the TV series who's basically, well, there's two I can think of who are basically just you, Alan. That's uh, interesting. Oh, I'll tell you who else I'd kill. Anybody who plays their music out loud in a public area. <clears throat> Anyone wa- walking down the street playing music out of a phone. Absolutely no reason for that. All you arrogant twat. I think, um, I think I'd cut the label off off a mattress where it says like this is illegal to chop off oh, um right. just just for just for the joke of it <laughs> a lot of people on twitter would probably beat me to it so I don't are you dipping into your 1990s stand-up material so because <laughs> <laughs> let's talk about this film because what, what characters do we have we have a uh, a waitress frank grillo. and her daughter yes and frank grillo who is sort of the main... I, I think of him as the main character of these films. He's only in two of them, but... Yeah, I, I feel like they were setting him up as the face of the franchise, realising Ethan Hawke wasn't going to come back. Yeah. Well, he couldn't, he died. Um, <laughs> to, to get ahead of ourselves, he comes back in the next one. Frank Grillo is this character. It's nice to have that connective tissue. Mm. It's weird there isn't more of that in the franchise. It well, is weird, isn't it? Uh, yeah, I was really surprised actually that there is very little. I mean, we do have the the homeless guy. Uh, what's his Edwin Hodge? Is that his name? The the guy from the first film, the homeless guy. Oh, uh, right. is he in it again somewhere? Yeah, he is. He's in the first three. Edwin Hodge is the actor's name, and the character is called Dante Bishop. He's not a main oh. role. He's he's a supporting part. Okay, but... so I I know who Dante Bishop is from the other films. I had no, I had not realized it was the same guy in the first film. Ah, yeah. That yeah. that's a nice tie-in, but I had not realized that whatsoever. Well, to be honest, even with Frank Grillo, like between the second and third film, like that doesn't have to be the same character at all. It, they could have yeah. just uh, yeah. done. So- well, I I imagine it was written so that. They could recast it if, if the, he asked really for, for any more, than more money. Six grand a week. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um. So here we have. He's kind of like our lead, and he's out. He's got a very rote backstory of his son died, and now he's going to go out and get the guy who did it. But uh, he's a bit of a, a guardian angel, really. He comes across a bunch of other people in need of some help. Um, a waitress and her teenage daughter, so he helps them. Yeah, and reluctantly then there's a young white them. couple who join them, and that's sort of our main bunch. He's set up as a good guy, which I think, even though he's on a mission of revenge to murder, I think works because you are contrasting him with, you know, the butcher, just men driving around with machine guns massacring innocent people, and not mm. so innocent people. Um, so comparatively speaking, he has a moral compass of a sort, and therefore that makes him seem like an angel to us, the audience. And his, and his motivation to go and kill someone is vengeance of the death of his son. So it's like, okay, we yeah, kind of understand, understand that. But, mm. and, and ultimately, you know, spoiler alert, he doesn't follow through with it. He sort of sees that it's not worth it. It's not going to get him what he wants and all that. So, uh, you know, for him, it's it's a catharsis moment that he doesn't actually have to kill the person. You know, ultimately, he's a good guy. Yeah, he, he becomes a reluctant guardian angel, like you say, uh, of these people that he just comes across in the street. Mm. You've got, yeah, you've got, the, so you've got the waitress woman and her daughter, and then this other couple who kind of 
never feel like we really care about them. I don't know if that was just me. I thought they were going to die much earlier on. Uh, yeah. I thought they were just sort of like, yeah, body count. But They never uh, get developed enough for us to care about them somehow. No, no. What are they? They're divorcing or something. Uh, yeah, but then at the end they're like, well, we may as well love each other if we're going to die. Yeah. I don't know that th- those two never felt like it really paid off <laughs> quite. Um, yeah, as it was, no. it was supposed to. But then yeah. the the waitress woman, she's like, uh, she seems very rounded, and and that whole bit worked really nicely. Yeah, she's nice. I like her, and they, they have this whole thing with her dad. Um, is uh, he's got cancer or something, and he, without telling the others, uh, without telling the rest of his family, he sort of volunteers himself to like this rich family pay to have him come over to basically kill him. Um, and we get this in a strange sequence. It's got all this like um, you know, diffused lighting and uh, soft focus and all this, and I'm like. Am I watching uh, characters imagining this? Is this like a fantasy sequence or whatever? I kind of expected him to come back later on and maybe he hadn't been killed, but I guess he just had been killed? Yeah, I feel like that was the point of that was just saying, hey, look, the rich people kill the poor people. It's it's another example of a real loose end Mm. that this franchise is notorious for, really. (laughs) But I think it's there just as a nice bit of world building. And I, and I must say, it's it's a really nice little element, just this idea of like, oh yeah, rich families kind of want to take part, but don't want to go out and put themselves in any danger. So they're just going to buy, mm. you know, it's it like, like people who go out and hunt lions on safari now, mm. essentially, you know, it's, it's a similar sort of thing. They're not putting themselves in a, any actual danger. They're just mm, totally the thrill of the kill. Yeah. And I like that can. as a development. I just think how that was presented in the film, yeah. like I say, yeah. just, it was a really strange, am I seeing, what am I seeing here? Is this actually happening? Is it someone imagining this? And it, it never felt properly resolved. Um, and then we have a kind of a, a a main villain, Big Daddy, who is this sort of. There are these like government sanctioned trucks that are going around and killing people. Um, and there's this guy in one of these big trucks. He's got a huge sort of Gatling gun kind of thing that he kills people with. But he's he just looks like a butcher, doesn't he? He's got this like sort of mm. cap on, and um, it's very Texas Chainsaw. Well, isn't it? Uh, isn't his truck like a kind of? If I just imagine this, but isn't it like a sort of repurposed meat lorry thing? No, it's like a proper big he, truck. He's he's wearing a big apron covered in blood anyway, that's probably why yeah. I'm... I'm pretty sure they have the, that kind of, you know, those transparent plastic... Um, yeah, you know, that's like, what I'm thinking I of, think I they think, have yeah. that in the truck, but I, it's funny you should say Butcher, because I had that same sort of um, yeah impression of him. Well, he do, yeah, he wears a big leather apron thing. But it does feel like, again, it feels like imagery to evoke kind of horror ideas, stuff you can put on the poster, rather than actually having any real purpose. Mm, true. Mm. True. Yeah, the... yeah, particularly to say that, like, you know, given that he is government-sanctioned, it might make sense if he was, you know, just done up in, like, riot gear or something. <laughs> Not even, like, a, a big boss, rather. You know, it would make more sense if it was more like a SWAT team <laughs> that was deployed rather than just... But I don't know. But then you get the sense that the government is fully on board with the theatricality of this whole <laughs> mm. purge thing, isn't it? So, yeah. So at the start, there's a there's a couple traveling to the city, and their car breaks down on the way. Well, yeah, their car's been vandalized. Basically, some people have like spied them as a target and want to kill them during the purge. So they like just you know break the car, so it'll break down down the road, and then they can hunt them yeah that's that's the idea isn't it well they don't because they have this very stereotypical um sort of city gang that uh you know wearing these masks and stuff uh a group a group of youths if Mm. you will and but they end up getting them they don't want to kill them they take them to the rich people who use them as sort of like a hunting most dangerous game kind of thing yeah yeah but I mean that that's annoying because it's just like in what world would you embark on a big trip like that? Oh God, I know. <laughs> with with the purge happening that night, it's just, you just you wouldn't. <laughs> There's no People way. Still out at the you shops go... and stuff. Like, oh, we better get yeah. home now. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you better. You'd be home an hour, at least an hour to spare. <laughs> like locker, like you just you would, yeah. Hmm. 
well, would you? I might not even stay at home. I might go and hide out in the woods or something where <laughs> no one's going to find me. <laughs> or unless someone comes walking around the woods with heat vision on. Or... <laughs> <laughs> Um, but what is the, Alan, you were just about to touch on it. What is the plot here? Because I actually, I saw it a couple of weeks ago and I just remember it as sort of like a sequence of these people sort of, I think that they're just trying to get out of the city or something. Uh, they're trying to get through the city. They're, they're trying to get to a, so the waitress woman, and hmm. perhaps it's telling that I have no idea anybody's character's names are. I'm not sure what that means. <laughs> but yeah, the waitress woman, she calls her waitress friend who we saw at the beginning scene, um, because they're like, oh, can we come and hold up at yours? Yeah. So the, oh, yes. they're heading there with the idea that Frank Grillo man can uh, then borrow their car because he wants to go off and do his own thing. Mm. So that's why he's reluctantly on board. Th- they, that's kind of the bit. And then it's a kind of like Warriors style. We've got to get through each zone. Look, there's, there's some biker gang here. Here's another p- bunch of people going to try and kill us. Mm. But it doesn't feel too episodic in that sense because they've got this other overrunning thing of this gang that's particularly kind of chasing them for whatever reason and you've Mm. got like the government stormtrooper thing going on as well Mm. Mm. so that feel that feels chaotic but it doesn't it makes sense they're kind of on a journey Mm. yeah i guess it's and they're just dealing with each problem at a time and they're kind of running Mm. down the subway tunnels and and that sort of thing and there's a major plot point where they get to the friend's house Mm-hmm. Uh, and that becomes a whole thing. They're basically they're safe, and the mm. only problem is that Frank Grillo like realizes he's been conned, and they haven't got a car for him, and so he's pissed off. And then is it the sister? Who's that? The woman? It's kills the waitress's the... friend's sister. Is it? <laughs> yeah. Who then kills her because she's been cheating with that lady's husband yeah uh, so this is a whole family that are living together in a house as a so the one woman we've already established her sister with a husband and then their dad yeah and then maybe someone else mm. is their mum sure. there as well is there like an older lady maybe yeah oh, maybe I oh i don't know hey, yeah but there's a whole bunch of people there in what is a very big apartment um and a very yeah. nicely dealt uh nicely uh, put together apartment as well got all sorts of stuff which i was a bit like that when we were going to some crappy in a city tower building, that's not what I was expecting. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Especially as we know one of the people who live there is a waitress, presumably not like particularly high earner. So mm. <laughs> one of them has a lot of money <laughs> so in <Yeah>. that family. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing that we get, and I feel like we don't really deal with in a very satisfactory way, mm. the idea of a much more... Because The Purge, the films in general, they revel in kind of, the joy of killing. We want to kill strangers. Whereas... But that, yeah, just mad sociopathic murderers going out on a killing spree. Yeah, which would be a rarity, surely, even in these exactly, legal yeah, circumstances. Exactly, it wouldn't be a lot. Whereas the real thing would be people, do you know what? I'm going to fucking shoot my husband because he's a twat told me all the mm. time and I finally yeah, got a chance I'm to get gonna away with it. I'm going to save it up for months and months and plan it out. Yeah. And, and this is a thing, you know, I, 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 I wish the film franchise got into this more because to me what would be scary is that kind of like the thing that idea of like oh anyone in this you know Mm -hmm. we're all gonna hide in this bunker from the outside world but then one of the people here might turn on any one of us Mm. and that that is a nice premise i think and and instead you just like everything else in this franchise they kind of pay quick lip service to it and then Mm. immediately discard it and Mm. yeah and and a part of me kind of likes that we just sort of like skirt the edges of all of these various different goings on that happen on this night but uh, yeah maybe maybe because there's no one truly satisfying element in here that's why i just come away i think that's it yeah. yeah Yeah. If even one of them, I mean, my favorite, if the bit that I do actually really like is the whole um, most dangerous game thing where these rich people sort of bid on going into this. It's sort of, yeah. it's a bit like a laser tag sort of room <laughs> yes, that they go in and start killing people. Even that's not as satisfying as it should be, though. I, I don't know why, but mm. it just doesn't quite, you know, I, I, I'd i like a full on film of that. Yeah, you know, like essentially a, a remake of the most dangerous game, mm. but mm. 
but you know they they're kidnapped right at the start of the purge and then they find themselves in a maze or whatever mm. and there's a big cathartic moment at the end where they just gun down all the rich people who've been watching <laughs> and on them. and and i guess you know I, I don't know if you've seen the hunt the uh the film that came out this year at the time of recording 2020 uh which was itself kind of a most dangerous game knockoff yeah Possibly from Blumhouse, thinking about it. Maybe there is a sense of it's been done before. Like the Maze Runner basically yeah, does that, doesn't yeah. it? And Running Man, that's kind of the same concept, really. Yeah, yeah. Mm. But it, it, I don't know, it's just, it is just lacking something. But I agree, it's nice. I, I... It feels weird that there's no kind of, even when they were at, you know, the waitress's friend's house, that, like, that I guess maybe it there are personal stakes involved because there are characters that actually know each other. The thing with the most dangerous game stuff is that it comes as like the big third act like sequence, but yeah. there's no personal stakes involved. It's just another like, oh, we need yeah. to get out of this. <laughs> um, but it's a bit more of an elaborate situation than what they've been in so far. Mm. Some people are going in there with guns and some people are going in with like an axe or a sword or something. It's like, come on, you can't bring a sword to a gunfight, you know? Yeah. So as soon as... Yeah. They've got a gun off someone. It's like, well, we're just going to kill everyone now. <laughs> yeah. I also think there's more people that are being hunted in there than aren't. So it's like, and in the dark as well, it just doesn't feel like a very uh, safe, like some of these rich people are surely going to mistake, the, you know, themselves yeah. for the victim or yeah. they're going to be overpowered, obviously. Uh, yeah. You'd, you'd think it'd be limited to one at a time. Go and pick your weapon, go and have a bit of fun in the maze. Yeah. Right, you're out, next one in. Comparing this to, like, trophy hunting, you don't go out into a cl- enclosed pit of lions to try and shoot one. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you go into, you go on a big bloody tower and just, like, sniper them from a distance. Yeah. And someone puts yeah. out some meat to draw them close. <laughs> it's yeah. like, that's what it would be like in real life. There's no way they'd put themselves in any real danger. Yeah. Yeah. But that might be more satisfying if then they still manage to find a way to kind of turn it round on them. Well, that's, yeah, The Hunt. Mm. You should watch The Hunt, Calvin. I think you'd like it. Yeah. I think I've already said this to you. It's, it's, it's this kind of trashy nonsense. It's, hmm. yeah. You know, it's only, it's only now that I'm sort of, we're going through the plot, I realise just how much happens in this film. Because cause even after that, there's they basically get rescued from that by the underground resistance, I guess, which is kind of a, a plot that's kind of bubbling under, which, again, doesn't really pay off here other than that they kind of come and rescue them at the end. And then we go and have to conclude the the Frank Grillo storyline where he goes and is going to kill this man and doesn't. And then the boss, the bad guy, comes back at the end, kills him, but... Yeah, because there is that whole government conspiracy thing in there, which is, I think much better explored in the next film but here it is just this sort of um the people aren't purging enough so the government are going out and just killing citizens which doesn't seem very productive <laughs> well only the poor citizens but i i like it as an acknowledgement because i just never really buy the premise of these films that you know people are itching to go out and kill their fellow man mm. on the street and mm. and I think the fact that the film kind of addresses that and goes yeah look we get it it's not realistic <laughs> <laughs> here's why it might happen this way yeah. I did notice at the end there you know the siren goes off signaling the end of the purge so he survives and all that but I will say you gotta admire they respect the siren everyone respects oh, yeah. the siren once that goes off you stop even if you're mid stab because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, you could just finish them all off like, who's gonna know Who's going? Yeah. When they're clearing up their bodies, well, are they really yeah. going to ask that many questions? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 True. But I, I, I like that this franchise as a whole builds to a sense that there's an almost religious element to this whole yeah. holiday, to the point that you start to buy things like that. Like, oh, I guess they would adhere to the rules, because it's about more than just the superficial level of blowing off steam. It's become meaningful on a whole new level for these characters and the people in this world. So, mm. some of them anyway. So yeah, it's um, something that's a bit weird and hard to buy initially, but as the franchise goes on, I think it kind of starts to make more sense and, and cover up the issues I have with it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have one other complaint about this film. Um, mm. So, the main guy, as we know, he's he's aiming for this particular guy. He's going to go and kill him. He knows where he lives and everything. If I was in that situation, I would probably go to that house, or at least near to it, 
mm. before the purge, rather yeah. than having to drive straight through a city centre in an armoured car yeah. <laughs> to get there, I would just, you know, park a couple of streets away. And, and, <laughs> yeah, and then, count down until seven. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a fundamental flaw here that I don't think is addressed. <laughs> Unless mm. he just he was itching for trouble, he knew he was just going to drive through the city, find something, and get involved. <laughs> He's just playing hard to get the whole time. Okay, uh, I'll go first. Uh, it step up definitely from the first one. I think it does much more with the concept. Still doesn't really feel ultimately satisfying, but mm. it it's getting there. Um, mm. And just some of the stuff, like, I, I love that we're out in the streets and seeing what's going on and passing alleys where there is, you know, murders happening or something happening over here or some mental person and all these different districts. I think that's just um, much more interesting as an overview of what uh, a city might be like if this mm. were a real thing. Um, it would be a six from me. I must say, I, I think I have a really soft spot for this series. I compared to other schlocky horror films that just pump out sequels non-stop i think they're a hell of a lot better than saw for example Mm -hmm. oh yeah as a franchise none of them are quite at the level that i think they're like good (laughs) but i mean i i'll i'll go i'll see all of them and I might rewatch a lot of them again at some point 10 years from now who knows but yeah i agree The, the second one's a huge step up it might be my favourite of the bunch so far. I, I'm not, it gets quite hard to differentiate between <laughs> the latter three, I think. Uh, I give it a 6 out of 10. Yeah, I, I agree. I think this is a step up from the first one. Just It does sort of develop the ideas, but more, more so just because it has a better structure and it kind of makes a bit more sense as a plot. Uh, there's still the odd loose end here and there, but I think generally... It's it's a better better crafted film. Uh, I gave it a seven, same as the first one, but a, a, a solid seven. Yeah, good seven. Who'd have thought you'd be the most positive? I know, I'm, I'm amazed. <laughs> yeah, Calvin, do you watch Rick and Morty? No, or is it just me and Alan? Oh, okay. I I feel I feel like we'd be remiss if we didn't at least briefly mention their purge episode at this point, which. Oh came out between that film and the subsequent one that we're about to speak about. Uh, Rick and Morty do an episode in season two where they go to a planet that does purging, and so it's basically just Rick and Morty doing the purge. And it's really good, and it makes you kind of wish for a world where these films were done that well. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Because I think, you know, not, not to jump right ahead to us pitching ideas for sequels and that sort of thing, but you could do anything with this premise. It, it's like, it's a blank slate. It's just, it's it's like zombies or time travel. Mm. You know, it's something you graft on to a diff- like an idea for a film. Yeah. <laughs> you go, it's this, it's this romance, blah, 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 blah. These two lovers torn apart. But why are they torn apart? The Purge. <laughs> and like I say, that, that Rick and Morty episode is just proof of, of the potential going to waste in these films because it's excellent. Mm. It's the space phone Grandpa gave us. Hello? Hey, Summer, it's Grandpa. I need you to do me a favor. I can barely hear you. Who is it? Morty and I are on a planet that's purging. I need you to take down... A plan that's what? We're on a planet that's purging, Summer. Purging. We lost our car and my gun and we're in a purge. Ooh, is it Daddy Mason? Like the movie The Purge? Yes, I I need you to take... That movie sucked. Oh, my God. Hold on. It's not Daddy Mason? Dad, who the... Are you okay? I'm putting you on speaker. Taddy? Yes, Jerry, it's Taddy. A person no one's ever heard of until now calling you on a space phone. I can't tell if you're being sarcastic. (laughs) Reload fast. Summer, we need you to take down this number. Quit screwing around. Morty, are you all right? No. Why are you with Taddy Mason? Holy dead, shut the... Anyway, shall I talk about what I'd do if the purge was real? You've already <laughs> sort of touched on it, Sol, because I would be an absolute coward and I would <laughs> immediately hide out in some wood or, I don't know, I would try to remove myself. I wouldn't trust anyone. I don't know. My instinct, like I say, would be go and hide in the woods. But then I think as it's portrayed in these films, <laughs> if you were in one of these mil- movies, they'd have like sociopaths out with heat vision goggles and machetes running around the woods, <laughs> killing everyone who's hiding. But then what if we have our own... Well, not we, because we're not going to be together for it, obviously, but <laughs> if we had our own 
x-ray glasses or maybe just get so <laughs> remote that you know there's places up in scotland or whatever i'd plan for this like a little island <laughs> off off the mainland yeah yeah but everyone's yeah. gone there. that'd be a bit that'd become big business though you'd you'd have that'd be a thing where like be airbnb would like skyrocket to like insane costs for the night <laughs> on these little remote <laughs> safe holds <laughs> If it was real and I was in America, I would just have a load of like Gatling guns attached <laughs> to my walls and I'd like run around on the rooftop. Mm. I'd have remote control triggers <laughs> that I could activate from the safe room. Yeah. <laughs> it's the same as uh, like deterring burglars. You know how you put a burglar alarm on the front of your house, but it's just an empty yeah. shell. It's not like a real alarm. <laughs> it's just so burglars yeah. look at their row of houses and go, which one's the easiest one here? Yeah, <laughs> is it this next film when we open with, or is it the last one where there's a shopkeeper? Yeah, who's, that's this one. Um, that really annoyed me. What because oh, which the shop he stops someone shoplifting, so she kill she wants to kill him. Ne- no, near the start of the film, <laughs> there's a shopkeeper. Once the purge kicks off, and he's stood like in front of the door with oh, a gun. Yeah, yeah. Is it a shotgun saying, "Oh, don't you come trying to rob my shop." Put your shutters down. <laughs> I can see you've got shutters. Yeah, it's just when... This is in the fourth film, actually, yeah. When the young lad is walking about and you would just sort of see him. Which is interesting because I thought that was... Because it, it, it hints at something that, again, is not very well addressed in these films. Which is looting, which would be far more common than murder. <laughs> oh, um, absolutely, yeah. Massively. Just You just go out and smash stuff and steal some stuff and, you know... That you know what I I would be tempted now that you mention it if if some yeah if crime was legal I'd be tempted to go out and like break into McDonald's and steal a load of their like McDonald's ingredients so I could do McDonald's at home <laughs> but make like a a Big Mac with twenty patties in it that's, but then you'd be you'd you still life, be outside like and you know I what know, about those sociopaths. Like, and, and McDonald's would have a fucking Ronald McDonald's guy walking around in the mask with you know a big. <laughs> A load of like nunchucks with blades on them. It, it just wouldn't be worth it. <laughs> <laughs> well, what this film starts with is we start with a, a flashback to because um, yeah, we haven't mentioned actually this entire series is set quite a ways in the future, though you can't tell from the fashion, the technology, <laughs> anything. Well, the first one's set in twenty twenty. 2022, I think, is that right? And um, it came out in 2013, so that was nine years. It feels like it's in the not-too-distant future, but it, it also feels like it's a sort of alternate America kind of feel to it. You know, it's mm. it, you know, it's supposed to take it... Like I say, if you think about the premise too much, it, it will fall apart quite quickly. Well, th- this film, the third one's meant to be sent in uh, 2040. I've, I'm just seeing now so that's like that's really? quite a ways in the future for like literally yeah. no kind of development but the it's film all begins... the all the developments going into securities <laughs> yeah actually securities well the, the most annoying thing on that front is that the most sci-fi element like the most sci-fi entry of the lot is the fourth one which is a prequel <laughs> mm, which yeah, is with those set... contact lenses yeah, has all these like really elaborate sci-fi <laughs> contact lenses, yeah. um, far surpassing technology we we currently have. Mm. But the uh, the things begin with a flashback to a family that are tied up, and um, it's a bit of a horrific scene where the guy who's about to kill them all says points to the mum and he says, "You can only." save one of your family and she saves the daughter and then years later the daughter is a political candidate um going up against the founding fathers the new founding fathers it's quite a hook of an opening mm. um and then they just doesn't go anywhere it's just backstory it's just her backstory but it's like you don't need that backstory to be against the purge it, 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 yeah. it feels like she needs <laughs> the personal motivation but yeah she's sort of this political candidate elizabeth mitchell who i've seen in stuff but i couldn't quite place one but she's yeah she's the progressive candidate going up against which well, she's progressive we don't know actually what her other policies are but she doesn't want the purge anymore and the new founding fathers of america are very upset by this so they have their own candidate um and they seek to kill her on the night of the purge and her security is played by frank grillo and that's kind of the main thrust of the story mm-hmm <laughs> I mean, look, I don't think it's massively politicizing things to say that were this reality, 
I, I think it's pretty safe to say the Democrats would be against the purge and the Republicans <laughs> would probably be for it. Well, yeah. <laughs> like, I say that's, that's not politicizing that's it. That's kind of where we're at. I think it is. <laughs> I think that is exactly <laughs> what you <they're> do. <doing. laughs> I feel like I feel like the Republicans would be against it until the Democrats were against it, <laughs> at which point they would decide to be for it just for the sake of it. <laughs> so they could have pointless fucking protests and did did you notice by the way uh the the founding father guy in the second one is it it's called Donald Donald Trump <laughs> <laughs> um Talbot yeah Donald Talbot oh don oh, okay uh which I just thought was interesting cuz Donald is just such a kind of <laughs> white prick <laughs> name <laughs> And again, and again, I should add that you know this was pre two thousand sixteen. This was pre Donald Trump's. Uh, mm. I don't even think he was campaigning for you know back in two thousand and fourteen. I mean, this is what I can't believe. It. Obviously, this film is election year. They were playing into the whole idea that this was you know going to be a contentious election and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, this was the first one where the current political climate was really starting to consciously influence the films. Oh, definitely, yeah. And I don't know how much, like, when it was written or something, obviously, I mean, Trump mustn't have even been the candidate when this was written, but things do sort of fall together quite nicely for this, like, you know, a female, let's say, yeah, Democrat against the sort of Republican. And and they are, I mean, you know, they go to church and they're very uh, devout and all that kind of... It's a bunch of old white people. It's very stereotypically uh, Republican-looking people. It's worth saying in the fourth one they make a very specific uh, reference that this is a third party that has come in and beaten the Democrats and Republicans. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I mean... But yeah, from an analogy point. Well, that's... Yeah, it's your libertarians, isn't it? (laughs) That's what they want. (laughs) <laughs> That's what they're they're all about. No no law. <laughs> Get rid of all infrastructure. Less government. So yeah, we have the the political uh, candidate, and keeping her alive is the main thrust of the thing. And that's where all these various characters that join them along yeah. this journey they all get involved because they are inspired by her. I I just want to talk about her actually for a moment. And and it's worth noting, I think, because we've sort of glossed over it there, unless I just forgot that it was said, but. There are people specifically trying to assassinate her, yes, because of what she she stands for. So yeah, they're, they're trying to keep her alive throughout the purge against mm-hmm. people who are actively trying to kill her specifically for political reasons, and mm. it becomes bigger than just about you know these characters not dying. It's mm-hmm. it's standing for something more than that. So in terms of plot, he gets a phone call. It's the insurance company saying, "Oh, we want." like six grand or we're not insuring your company tomorrow and he's like oh shit so that means he has to and like one of the other characters says like oh they can't do that and it's like hmm. yeah I, they probably can't actually <laughs> I know America is like a <laughs> capitalist hellscape but I'm pretty sure you won't be able to get away with that uh, even, even in those circumstances if his cover ran out expired like the day before the purge and he forgot to renew it <laughs> but Maybe. it's it, the problem is it's just sort of thrown away where he, it could so easily be done better and, and like and, and the whole point is that this girl this teenage girl is shoplifting and he's like hey come on don't shoplift and she's like fuck off i'm gonna kill you tonight you prick <laughs> and it's like none of that works and then this whole fucking spring breakers run of teenage girls comes along with their guns and all that was so shit. Like that well, was just I, like I, it. It really that's that's when it really fell into kind of stupid horror film kind of nonsense thing. I don't mind it because they get immediately d- dispatched, don't they? They pretty much like they come along and it's like for fuck's sake, what is this? And then they're just like killed. Yeah. <laughs> it's like oh yeah, they turn up at the happened. shop and then they're immediately killed by um, another character, Lainey yeah. Rucker, who they're initially quite impressed by. They're like, oh wow, you're a real proper purger and then she's given that up that life and now she goes around as a a health worker helping people on the street but she comes and just mows them down um i actually quite liked just talked about missed opportunities again um these are like what 15 year old girls they're still in their school Mm. gear um the idea being that these girls have grown up with the purge being you know a part of society Mm. and i i quite liked that we were sort of 
just scraping the sort of like the surface of that. Like she mentions at one point that she's killed her parents, which is so horrible. And I think that the, I think the actress is really good. Who's playing Kimmy, who's the main of these, the main one of these schoolgirls. And I think she's horrible, like such a great yeah, villain character. Yeah. Um, and I thought it was a bit of a shame that she wasn't through it more, to be honest. The thing is, Calvin, I think, I think, I think what, um, I think the the main difference between us here, Calvin, is what we want from these films because I yeah. hated everything about that. First of all, <laughs> I thought it's just a really badly written character, like not realistic in any way. Oh, uh, I don't know. I, I I've seen girls like that. <laughs> you haven't. <laughs> oh, I have. Well, I mean, from afar, I I, I don't get involved. And then, like, they turn up at the end with a. A, not at the end at the, for the scene with like a gold plated machine gun like where the oh I love from? it like what what is this a James Bond movie uh, it's, it's <laughs> with so, the fairy lights all over such... the cars and the proper pimped out I love <laughs> but it but this that just feels like film nonsense and I didn't like that and I'll tell you what I really didn't like about the whole scene so when your woman she's driving the triage ambulance thing she comes mm. plowing them down she gets out she shoots them in the face it's like that. In throughout the first three films, that was the first time I was like, that is a character who we're on the side of relishing violence, enjoying violence. And as a film, Mm. we're enjoying murder. And I don't think that's ever happened in the film before. Because even when people die, even when the good guys kill people, when the bad guys kill people, it's a bad thing. Whereas Mm. this was like, yeah, kill them, yay. That's true. And Mm. it really stood out to me because it was like, that's what I was expecting when I was going into these films. And I didn't mm. get that. Um, and mm. it's weird because it never kind of plays off in any way. It's just like, yeah, well, we like her. So she's allowed to kill people. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. well, we, I think we just hate those schoolgirls. I mean, they well, are that's, just that's the thing. If, if they killed them in the, to defend themselves, like that wouldn't have been a problem. It's the way it's filmed and the music uh, and the gratuitous nature of it. No, it mm, didn't, yeah. didn't fit with what we've seen before. I didn't like it at all. Yeah, I loved it. Yeah. I was finally getting what I wanted. <laughs> Can we just just on the the idea of um, characters growing up in a world where the purge has always been? I like the idea of an Ethan Hawke mashup. You do a kind of boyhood set in the purge. <laughs> just pick up with the actor every every few years. Brilliant. Just see how he's yeah. getting along, how he's coping with it. <laughs> I think it'd be quite interesting. Mm. Be better than Boyhood and better than the purge. <laughs> 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 I like where I might be jumping ahead a bit here, so do stop me because we do have more similar to the second one. There's a lot of scenes of them going through the city in a state of disarray and coming across all of these horrific things and people and stuff and seeing all this stuff. Um, we do touch on the occasional sort of interesting thing. There's um, the um, Laney, the triage um, ambulance lady. She uh, they're going around helping people and they stop yeah. for this one lady who has shot her husband and she's like really upset about it because she's like oh they told me i would feel better if i did this and i don't and i don't want my husband to die i don't want to be responsible for this um which i thought was interesting but it's it's glazed over in like a couple of minutes but again you know another perfect example of a really interesting idea that's just kind of chucked in here paid lip service and then abandoned yeah Mm. yeah and these films are full of that, and it, mm. if they were, if they are just going to throw them away like that, I kind of wish they had twice as many of those things in here. You know, it's just yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, I like where things do eventually end up because they end up taking refuge with these sort of uh, freedom fighters, these rebels who are planning on. It turns out they're planning on going and um, uh, killing the new founding fathers who are gathering at this church. Mm-hmm. And uh, the political lady and Frank Grillo get a wind of this, and she's very much against it because she does not want to be as bad as them. She does not want to kill them to solve her problem, uh, which I thought was a good sort of... We've got characters around for a couple of scenes just sort of weighing up the pros and cons of this. Um, We're supposed to be on both of their sides, I think, but I I liked that the Mm. film was getting into those kinds of moralistic discussions about purging. Uh, just That all just felt tacked on at the ending, and, and then, you know, it's like you go, oh, yeah, McKelty Williamson's dead, so now... I'm going to rebuild the deli. <laughs> and then, like, no idea where... Because presumably you still have to, like, pay for that somehow. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know. If, I guess McKelly Williamson was renting it. Does If he dies, does it just go to the person who he works for him? Did he leave it in his will? Do you <laughs> I don't do know. that? Uh, exactly. Hmm. 
but he probably came up short one month and paid them in shares of the company <laughs> out there, the majority stakeholder. Uh, but political lady wins, so no more purges, eh? An odd choice on the part of the franchise to kind of yeah. put something of a cap on the amount of sequels they can squeeze out of this thing. Mm. I think there's a lot of potential for she doesn't manage to end it, or they end Purge Night, mm. but the people do it anyway, or or you know. Yeah. But you're mm. you're kind of putting a once you start getting into that territory, it's like right, this this can't last forever anymore. Mm. You can't just keep churning these out. There, there's like maybe three left. <laughs> yeah, it, it's I don't know. It's weird. So so I mean, you know. On that note, they they went and made a prequel for the next one instead. Yeah. But mm. before we get to that, uh, should we rate this one? Mm-hmm. I enjoy it about as much as the last one. Maybe not quite as much, but it's all it's all very watchable nonsense at this point. So I give it a six out of ten. Hmm. I think I I kind of agree. You know, it, it's sort of, yeah, like you said, watchable nonsense, and it, it, I I still engage with the plot. There's definitely elements of this where I didn't like. I say it just felt like no, I don't like that. That's gone too far down into just kind of silly kind of film route. So it was a bit of a step down for me, but I still gave it a sturdy six. Yeah, you're really into this series, Alan. I'm I'm surprised. Uh, I, I mean, I'm, this is the most positive I'm going to be about anything in this franchise. I thought this was exactly what I wanted from a Purge film with some good villains, nice kills. I... I could there was a through line uh and i liked the whole gimmick of yeah we need to keep this political lady alive and all the characters sort of facilitating that uh yeah it's oh eight out of ten <laughs> oh i know i mean i <laughs> i thought alan was gonna go there you know with the last one i, I thought he was gonna <laughs> i was tempted it was close with this rating system, I'm sure you could. Oh God, I think I gave the Godfather lower than <laughs> lower than eight, but um, yeah, for this rate, you know, for what it is. Yeah, it's... exactly. You got to judge it by its own merits. And and now we have the first purge, the first purge. Uh, which is actually the fourth purge. <laughs> um, and as well as being the first purge, uh, it's also the first purge to not be directed by James DeMonaco. Is that mm-hmm. yes? Yes. 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 Still a writer, so still and presumably a producer. Yeah. I presume he's quite heavily involved. Gerard McMurray directed yeah. this. It it still feels a part of that same universe, but I think the horror elements are a bit more pronounced in this one. I thought there was some more genuinely creepy imagery and the whole lights in the eyes things, I thought that really did give you some... I I haven't been scared about anything in the previous three films. This one I watched, I was like, oh, actually, yeah, no, that is a bit unsettling. Yeah, like it, it, I agree with Calvin. It feels very much like this, you know, part of the same series. I'm not, I'm not saying that this is a real standout new voice coming in, but there is a degree of freshness with this new director. Mm. I think that does come from the fact that yeah, it does seem to stem from a legitimately black voice, and and therefore, I don't know. It just feels like a more authentic understanding of the working class life that it's attempting to dig into mm. that the other films the other films feel like they're written by a, a a white guy of privilege trying to do right by these films you know where this feels a lot more authentic and um also written not by to him. mention like you say yeah, 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 yeah. Mm. It, it's an experiment at this stage. It's kind of like a trial, and they just seal off Staten Island, and for 12 hours they're just kind of wondering what... Mar- like Marissa Tomai is the one who uh, is sort of actioning this. I have to say, I know obviously the point is the politicians don't care, they just want to kill people. But, you know, from her point of view, she's running a scientific experiment with very little in the way of scientific method here. Like, they're literally <laughs> incentivizing people to kill. <laughs> like, they say, oh, you yeah. know, if you go and get involved, we'll give you more money. It's like, it doesn't make any sense at all. Well, the reason I think it works for me is that they pretty much call it out in the film, don't they? Like, they, they you know, that the, the experiment doesn't work. People don't go along for it. And then these people start sending out hired people to 
stir shit up and mm. get yeah, him to how, kill. And... How did you feel about that? Because I, uh, I, I thought it was doing a disservice to the premise to just sort of insinuate, oh, well, a few bad eggs. And compared to what we see in the first few films, which are like proper, like every, everyone in this world is half the people are sociopaths now, you know, putting on masks <laughs> and killing. Whereas this, I think, sort of leads you to sort of believe, oh, yeah, well, there's Skeletor and the government and some just some bad eggs ruined it for the rest of us who would just been raving otherwise. But you've got to appreciate as well, yeah, this is the first time it ever happened. Yeah, I think the idea is that once this becomes the new normal, you know, in in the subsequent films down the line, I don't think it's meant to be mostly the government with a few bad eggs. I think Mm. it's meant to be just people go out and murder now because it's become part of the culture. But with this being the first one, like in the other films, I watch them thinking, well, it's not very believable. I don't think people would go out and do this. But if you kind of show me this here, how it was brought into being normal and and people were like okay i guess i will go out and kill them in this in the way it's set up it's do you really think in in any kind of real sense in america like particularly if you're black in america if someone comes to you go look, look you can do whatever you want there's no laws we're going to record everything you do and we'll know what you've hmm. done but we definitely won't punish you for it don't worry no way you'd believe that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no way it's obvious trap isn't yeah. it? so i'm surprised mm. anybody does anything I do like that it just ends up being a bit of like a street party. I think that's quite nice. Yeah, uh, and, and and that felt more true to yeah what would actually happen in reality. It probably would just be people just doing a lot of recreational drugs. People would go, oh no, no crime. All right, all the drugs we can possibly get our hands on. Then, like, yeah, let's just go fucking off our tits on drugs. <laughs> that that is how people I think would mostly react to it. I, mm. I don't think people do that the anyway. instinct would be yeah but we can do it and flaunt it in a street party and be like oi copper come and do coke off my ass <laughs> <laughs> yeah you got one psycho who's running around like killing people and you have yeah you see the one guy who does get killed who like he's, he's decided he's gonna take out his purge on the cash machine <laughs> and like crowbar the cash machine as if the company would have left a load of cash in there over purge night. I know. I, know. <laughs> I wanted him to crack it open and then it was just like empty and he's really pissed off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but like more than more of that sort of stuff, I think, especially with I mean the first one, kind of like petty crime. I agree. Would yeah. have been nice. And you know, on that note, what I really like with this film is the way the core focus of the plot is on this gang. <laughs> this gang leader kind of going, well, look, we should expect a load of shit tonight. You know, if anyone's planning anything against us, they're going to do it tonight. Mm. Mm. And I really like the whole idea of of seeing a gang kind of battening down the hatches and, and prepping for the purge. And, you know, obviously it doesn't... It kind of goes out the window somewhat shortly after that. But it's a core premise. I think it's a really good one. And I, I must say, I, like, I'm a bit sick of the whole gangster with a heart of gold sort of nonsense, you know. Like, he's, he's like, saves the entire community and all that. It's like, you're a drug dealer, mate. You're literally, like, killing the, the community around you. Like, <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's just... And, the, and like, you can, you can fancy it up as much as you want, but, like, those gangs are, are bad. <laughs> I don't know how, to, how else to phrase that. But they, and, mm. you know, they do take young kids and get them involved and groom them into this life. Yeah. Like, the, there are no good people in that world, not while they're mm-hmm. active in it, you know? If you come back, you go to prison for 10 years and sort of change your ways or whatever, fair enough, but... Yeah, I mean, look, I I say this as someone who's... Been in a gang. Barely scraped <laughs> the surface of gang movies. It's not a... An, like, I've not seen a lot of these films, so it's not. it doesn't feel like a tired old cliche to me, even though I'm sure it is. And also, I I think within the context of these films, you know, there's a lot of moral ambiguity and grey area, and I'm okay with that, you know, I I don't mind that. Well, I think that's perhaps the problem. I don't get much of a moral ambiguity sense from him. It feels like he's really pushed up as, he's a good guy at heart, he's just doing some business. And I just think you could make him more of an anti-hero, make him, he's trying to save this one person, because whatever their relationship's going on, 
he doesn't really care about it. Do you know what I mean? Like, I just feel like there's too much rhetoric about we're going to have to save the community from the white folks coming in and all that kind of thing. It's It just never quite feels that that's going to hang together for me as a character, you know? I think he's, mm. I think he's as much of a morally ambiguous character as Frank Grillo is in the second one. He's that exact same thing of, oh, he's, he's a... You know, he's off to kill someone, but we're going to bend over backwards to justify it and make you think it's okay. And No, I don't agree. I think it's sort of the opposite, because this guy... it's it's And it's not just what the character does, it's the way it's filmed and everything. Like, the guy literally takes off his jacket just so that he can start walking around in a vest. Like, that sort of film stuff. Yeah, because just... he's a big, muscly, cool guy. Yeah, it's just... That's just like... But, <laughs> but it's like, it's this repositioning of him to, like... Oh, well, now he's like the John McClane kind of hero guy. And I don't know. It just felt cheap, and and like he, he could just. It, 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 I I think what I mean is that character should have been dirtier. He could have been like, let's embrace that he's got this bad side. Use that, you know. I just it just didn't do that enough for me. I guess. I I, I agree with you, but I just don't expect these films to give me anything on that level, <laughs> so I'm not surprised that yeah, it isn't that's, there. That's fair, I suppose, yeah. <laughs> and I, I, I think by the standards of these films, he's a pretty solid character. Compared to everything we've seen up until now, he's he's decent. I preferred the main woman as a as a character, general character. Yeah, she's good too, I like her. She's a good like rabble rouser, you know, she's protesting against it and everything. She's pretty consistent. I thought the actress was a bit shit. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, really? I thought she was alright. I, I thought she was good when she's doing her protesting um, stuff, but later on, I... Yeah, she just feels like she's breezing through it. Um, I don't get terror from her. Um, particularly when the... What's the name of the young guy who uh, has the contacts in and he gets... Uh, yeah, yeah, he gets... He's, he's a bit shit. Yeah, oh, what is he up I, to? Him? I, I don't know. I, I liked him. He was my favourite uh, character in this, actually. And that whole sequence where you follow him being stalked around that warehouse... I don't mind the character, I just think his performance is a bit... Oh, I don't have crap. a problem with... Well, yeah, I know. The character is annoying, but, like, in a in the way it's supposed to be. Like, it's just like he's, like, he wants to go out there and do something, but then he can't when he's actually there. Like, he's, like, and he just keeps running himself into trouble. <laughs> it's like, for God's sake, mate. I, um, I think my favourite character is the, the guy who's wearing a kind of scarecrow-esque mask with teeth all around the mouth, like... <laughs> Like a kind of amped up Mighty Boosh character. <laughs> What's that one guy with like the baby head, like the plastic baby head <laughs> on like his mask? That's so weird. And I, but I thought that was well, I that was almost a scary moment where Naya is being uh, the female lead is being dragged into the sort of manhole by these weirdos. I think this is perhaps to this franchise's benefit that it predated Donald Trump because judging from the. Pussy grabber, like <laughs> oh my god, yeah. <laughs> they put it into that sequence uh, as a little dig. I don't know if they've really got the pussy. satirical chops to go after things like without tapping into something without meaning to, you know. It feels like that should have been the point that this series was born with, but I just oh completely, you know, yeah. the fact that that point has almost been thrust upon it, like it's mm. in the past, it's accidentally conjured up a lot of this imagery and you know the stuff that we mm. sort of take mm. for granted as being reality since they were made, and it's I find it quite yeah. fascinating, really. Yeah, but I, I like that the that the film is willing to plant its flag in the sand and be like, yep, you know what, this is our hill. We're not backtracking from any of this. This is and that's probably because yeah. I'm certainly more aligned with that political view. But. <laughs> yeah. I I think this is arguably the messiest film in the series to date. There's It feels like there's a lot of stuff going on even more than normal that is even less tied up. But I still find it very entertaining in a, a real kind of trashy horror movie kind of way. Hmm. So, I mean, if if we're at the point of, of rating it, I, I give this one a 6 out of 10 as well. Hmm. Yeah, I gave it I gave it a 6. Similar kind of thoughts, basically. Yeah, it's a bit of... Definitely things... I, I still f- sort of frustrated with the whole thing, and yeah, I yeah. gave it a 6. Uh, it's a 6 from me as well. Uh, I didn't think it hit the heights of the third one, but it, it did a lot of good stuff. Um, yeah, but I'm just so much less interested in prequels anyway, just by yeah, design. Yeah. So. Yeah. 
That's it. I'd I'd much rather learn a bit about the history and the origins of the Purge in a sequel. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we we just hear a bit of exposition. The the characters hide out from a madman in a museum, and there's like a an exhibition of one of the founding fathers that they have to like Scooby Doo style pretend to be <laughs> part of, and then and then one of them's gonna sneeze, <laughs> <laughs> and the other one puts his finger out to cover the nose. Uh. <laughs> I guess it's also just tough when like the third one went so big with its scope like yeah. to bring in all the political you know and basically sort of build to ending the purge and here it just it fe- it can't help but feel smaller because we're just dealing with yeah people with less kind of influence over mm. the situation yeah and any attempt to make it feel bigger just kind of takes you out of it because yeah. the eye the eye contact lenses for example these weird little glow in the dark camera lenses all the people are wearing just well we haven't seen those in the other films so mm. why are they here it doesn't mm. I've just remembered something that they introduced in the third film, which I was like, oh, that's a nice idea, and it never went anywhere. Uh, murder tourists. You see a load of people oh, yes. arriving from overseas yes. to get involved. And I was like, that's a great idea. That's a great concept. That could bring something in. And you, we see them later. It, and it is, it's in. great as well because it, it confirms that this is a uniquely American phenomenon and the rest of the world hasn't decided <laughs> to dip its toes into the water. Um yeah, I, I like that. Mm. And again, it's a it's a real kind of thrown away concept. Mm-hmm. It, it feels like every time James DeMonaco writes one of these, he just goes on Reddit and just reads like, "Why don't they do this?" kind of comments, and then goes, <laughs> "Oh yeah, that'll that'll take up a page." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's yeah. So that same year, uh, also saw the debut of the Purge. TV series. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which went by the name The Purge, mm. very annoyingly. <laughs> um I I watched this as it was going out. Oh. Um I got some screeners via work. Oh. And I think I gave up on episode 5. Oh, that's where I gave up. Four. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, no, episode four, in fact. I'm just looking now, I gave up. Like it just it's it, it, like I don't know how you feel, but I think it starts off really well, mm. this TV series. In a nutshell, this is a Purge movie arbitrarily, artificially padded out to be three, four times the length of a mm. Purge movie. Exactly. But without, without any like additional justification. Like they, they go down the route of having a whole load of intersecting characters who are having their own stories that come together. But they don't do what you would think, which is like, oh, we'll have enough characters that we don't get bored. They just they just pad it out with bullshit. Uh, and flashbacks, God. Oh, God, yeah. Episode one, I actually really quite enjoyed, because mm. it's everyone prepping for The Purge. It's before The Purge actually kicks off, from what I remember. Is that right? If I yeah. just remember? Yeah, the, whole first, the first episode ends, I think, with the shutters going yeah. down, as it were, and yeah. Yeah, and and you just see a lot of you know that there's a probably the best character in the TV series out of the protagonists is um this what is she like a businesswoman who's mm. hiring an assassin to kill her boss mm. during the purge. So again, conspiracy. <laughs> but then she like has to pay the guy. Although it's a woman, isn't it? She has to pay them during the purge because that's not illegal okay. then or yeah. something. Now I don't know if you got this far, Alan, but um, did you see? Did you see the boss? I, I was literally thirty seconds in, and I didn't. I was just like, oh, whatever. <laughs> it was literally that long. Well, the boss is probably the biggest get for this. Um... <laughs> what casting wise? Yeah, go on. Uh, care care to take a stab, Alan? <laughs> um, the Purge TV series level of um... uh, Ernie Hudson. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> that's that's so on point. I mean, <laughs> I'll, I'll give you a clue. There are um, there are several of these, and there's only one famous one. What? <laughs> what? The, the... If you kind of forget what you're, if you phase out for a second, you will think you're watching the famous one, and then you'll be like, <laughs> yeah. you'll be like, oh god, that's not oh, him. a Baldwin. Oh, it's a Baldwin. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it's William Baldwin. 
<laughs> basically playing Jack Donaghy from uh, 30 Rock. <laughs> I definitely did that when he first came on. I was like, oh, is that? That can't be. Oh, no, it's not. It's <laughs> I cannot someone else. tell you the amount of times I kind of... Because this was very much a show where I'd like, you know... It's a slog. I, I gave up when I was watching it initially. I put the effort into finish season one for this podcast. Mm. And there was a lot of checking my phone while it was on. And then you'd hear this, <laughs> I can't believe you're doing that. And I'd be like, oh my god, Alec Ball... Oh no, yeah, it's really Ball. <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> the, um, I, I will tell you, the thing that I quite liked, and it had actually nothing to do with The Purge, um, it turns out, but there's like a young couple quite well to do... Well, they're, they're getting there. It's like um, they're yeah. attending this uh, party, which is a pro-Purge elite, and they're there to sort of schmooze, mm-hmm. even though they don't agree with them politically. Um, and then it turns out that the 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 lady in this relationship, the the couple had sort of like a threesome arrangement with this other lady who's also at the party, and um, and there's some kind of human drama uh, stuff going on in the middle of all this purging stuff, and I actually quite liked that. Um, but then I could have just watched a drama about that, not yeah. you know, yeah. have the purge involved. Well, that's that's basically the this TV sh- series. It should have been that every episode like episode one Mm. genuinely pretty good i think it probably the best i'd probably like episode one more than any of the movies except obviously again it's like a promise that doesn't pay off because none Mm. of the stories are resolved but it it, like if i'm looking at my ratings on imdb for each episode here and it goes episode one seven out of ten episode two six out of ten episode three five out of ten episode four four out of ten like it's just as it goes on it is just the most boring, nothing happens, retreading the same mm. stuff, people in a... Because, it, you know, it's TV budget, so it's people in a room talking purge. It's back to the mm. first movie again. There's, it's not like exciting action stuff happening outside. It, mm. It's just... Just nothing happens until, like, the last two episodes, mm. and then it kind of gets vaguely interesting again. Not good exactly, but perhaps on par with a lesser Purge movie. Hmm. There's um, a, a few bits of human drama like we're talking about. There's uh, So the first one who, who I said you were like, Alan, <laughs> there's that well-to-do couple in episode 9 are like home invaded by a neighbour who basically just runs in with a gun pointed at them and he's just like, Oh, I'm sick of you. I'm going to shoot you because you bloody keep leaving your rubbish out and it's annoying me. (laughs) (laughs) Like, genuinely, he's got some issue about them, like, never inviting him over for dinner since they moved in and they I think they didn't oh they they chopped down a tree in the garden but it was on the it was on a like the 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 line the property line and belonged <laughs> to the, the other neighbors claimed it belonged to them See, I, I, yeah I respect that <laughs> and that's it it's like it's coming this point in the franchise to just have a, a kind of a gun standoff isn't very interesting but it's a core premise of just an annoyed neighbor <laughs> it's kind of I kind of liked it. it. It feels like maybe that should have been episode one. Mm. <laughs> I completely agree with what you you're saying, Sol. I think if this were an anthology series and you had like a different scenario every episode, because they do touch upon things. In one of the last ones that I saw, there's this um, with the lady who is going to kill uh, William Baldwin. Um, th- there's one of her co-workers kills another co-worker, and then after she. She's sort of in a bit of a a bit of a state, and then she's like, "So, are you going to talk to HR about the promotion, or am I?" Because <laughs> yeah, they were, they yeah. were they, it was the two of them that were up for this promotion, and she killed him, and yeah. and then it just kind of disappeared. I don't know if it got picked up later on, but it was again just like one of those sort of like, "Yeah, what would that do actually in that scenario? Like, would you have to fire her because what she did wasn't illegal?" So yeah. it's such a shame because that that whole plot strand is really interesting and and. Yeah, good initially. Like you say, it's it's dealing with the kind of ins and outs of office life surrounding the purge. Um mm. and, and like they as a company are all working through the purge. There's a business reason why they like have to stay operational during the purge. So Oof. they're on like it's a stock market, isn't it? I think it is, yeah. They're like on lockdown with the intense security hired in. And sadly it, it devolves into this nonsense with the boss secretly running a, a kind of rapey 
ring where they kidnap a load of women, including that woman, and and people are able to go and do what they want with them, and it's just very like, uh. It was more mm. interesting before we went down this kind of obvious route. Mm. And it, it, it all kind of comes together at the end, because there is a character played by a guy called Lee Tiergsen, I don't know oh, is he the one who's going after his sister? Uh, Lee Turgeson, I know him. He's in Oz. Yeah. Beecher in Oz. Oh. I've never really seen him in anything before. He has a... He's in Wayne's World. Yeah. Well, but it, he has a <laughs> real... <laughs> a real um, Jeffrey Combs vibe about him in, in this show. Uh, yeah. He rounds up a load of people to get revenge on them. He, he says he's giving them a fair trial... But he's got them all in cages, and he's like killing them for, and it and it's you know it's it's played for, kind of for laughs. It's oh, he's not the one who's after his sister. Sorry, I just want to. Yeah, no, sorry. I thought you were talking about the protagonist guy who's out. Like, oh, oh no, yes. no, 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 no. Yeah, no, different. When you said Jeffrey Coombs, I was like, what? <laughs> he's um, just you know, for example, he kidnaps uh that woman and. Her, the reason that he kidnaps her is because they went on a bad date once, and she mm. like what, said she was going to the bathroom and left him there, and so he's gonna kill her. <laughs> it's that sort of like nonsense that, but it, but I don't know. He's playing it with enough kind of relish, and it actually does become kind of quite entertaining near the end in a really kind of trashy nonsense way. And then the interesting mm. thing, Alan, is the one of the main guys is like got a gun to him and is just about to kill him and like you know escape and then the siren sounds ooh <laughs> and he just shoots him anyway <laughs> <laughs> so there you go that's you them, respect the siren that's them acknowledging the whole um what actually happens is he kind of goes oh well there you go uh, good you know good game everyone see you next year and then he shoots the guy <laughs> and he's like oh yeah the siren and he, you know it's it's this weird thing and then they go outside and there's a guy there a cop or something i can't remember but like a character we know and he kind of says like about what happened in there well to me it sounded like the siren went off and then i heard some gunshots (laughs) is that not what happened like covering for him and it's all just very like oh yeah yeah. i guess that is what happened (laughs) so i mean they're they're kind of playing with it and it's bad but like only because it's so badly padded out forever so, based on season one, I give the show a four out of ten. I don't know if you want to rate it, Calvin. Like, I, I, I gave up on it yeah. initially. It got a bit better near the end. I, I couldn't bring myself to watch season two, which is a shame because, by all accounts, it seems like season two might pick up a bit. Yeah, it's got Ethan Hawke in it, hasn't it? And I believe yeah. the the lady who does the Welcome to the Purge, uh, thing. She's actually in it as a character. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, but I don't, I don't know where they go with that. Um, I don't know if I can rate it to be, I've only watched five episodes of the season one, but it completely failed, uh, to, as a... If you give up on it and it doesn't hold yeah. your attention enough to come back, that's, that's a yeah. valid, uh, criticism. Let's say three, I don't know. I mean, I do kind of sympathize with what Alan said about, like, yeah, actually, after, I was fine watching the films, but then just... Uh, just being back in this scenario and it's so relentless and when you're subjected to that in a TV show format and it's like, oh God, am I really going to sit down and just watch another episode of this droning on with no resolution? Yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, yeah, at least I know with a yeah. film I'm going to have a beginning, a middle and an end. Yeah. yeah. Well, season two looks a lot more interesting in that it, it doesn't all seem to be set during the purge. Episode one apparently is dealing with the aftermath of the purge over the following year uh episode 2 is dealing with cleaning up the previous night's purge it it seems like the focus isn't on the purge itself and is more on dealing with the stuff that happens in between so i i a part of me does want to go back and watch some more i don't know the fact that season 1 was so crap and it got cancelled swiftly after season two. I don't know. I, I, it's probably not worth my time. Anyway, um, that was the franchise done for a while. Uh, until now, The Forever Purge, the new mm. one coming out. It's being billed as the fifth and final installment of the Purge series. I don't know how much truth there is to that. <laughs> yeah, why? Uh, 
Why stop? Yeah. 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 I mean, I think it might be the last one that James DeMonaco does. Or at least he's alluded to that in interviews, whether or not it's the last one they ever make. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. It's probably the, the last one in that it deals with them stopping the purge. You know, it, that's probably kind of why. The new director, even if this is the last one for a while, they'll just turn around ten years from now and do another one. I, I just can't see this hmm. for... this. It's, it's too good a premise, you know? that Even mm. if it means they reboot it, Sooner than they probably ought to, they'll they'll just. That's it. You can you can just do another story in the purge. Like yeah. You don't have to have any continuity with yeah. the previous characters at all if you don't want to. And I I don't think there's any other details about this one. That I'm sure I'll see it at some point in the future. It is really weird, actually. Is there a cast list or anything? Because I there, there's actors on IMDb, but no no one back from a previous one. I just find it weird that it was so you know it would have been out soon and we don't know anything about it. I mean, have you guys got any ideas for Purge movies? I'd like to see a real Ooh. you know like you know they do rom-coms for like Valentine's Day, New Year's Eve all these other holidays I'd like to see a big sprawling rom-com set during the Purge with just like <laughs> loads of loads of huge mm. name actors who come and do like a day's filming like Tom Hanks and Julia Roberts and so on but it's set during the purge that's why they all come together that would be pretty good yeah <laughs> i think there's a way of doing the tv show right maybe you just need to not have james DeMonaco leading it because at first i was thinking like oh wow like maybe they could do some like 24 sort of like real time sort of jumping yeah, around I thought, yeah yeah that might be interesting it's a 12 hour thing isn't it yeah it, like it makes sense but um no or have each episode is a separate story Maybe there's like little crossover elements, but mm. it's ultimately, you know, a self contained That's story. definitely the way I'd approach it. And because there's so much scope. Like I say, it's a blank slate. You know, you, you have an episode dealing with a farmer who has to go out and water his crops, otherwise they'll die. But the purge is on, so he's got to defend himself while he's doing it. You, you have an episode where. Uh, uh, um. What else do people do? Uh, <laughs> there's an astronaut on the space station, and the Russian cosmonaut tries to kill him <laughs> during the purge. <laughs> it's not in it. That's not in America, though. Is it? It, it, no, but you can do it when they're <laughs> over the USA. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, I do. If you got, if you're doing a ten episode thing, you just go and find ten directors or write directors or something. And go right. Give me a TV hour purge story. Hmm. Here's this. Here's your budget. And then the, everyone like will have a different tone, different feel mm. to it. I mean, I don't know how well it would sell to an audience, but that would be the interesting thing to yeah. see. Yeah, yeah. I think you could do like a really solid comedy or romance, or or you could do all these stories with the purge very easily. It, it, it really. You could it, certainly. I mean, yeah. You could definitely do a a murder mystery. Yeah, you know, a group of group of people, a few families or a few couples or something get together to celebrate the purge. Someone dies. You know, ultimately, Ooh, yeah, like the that. police aren't going to come sniffing around and and proving evidence. So it's up to the people there to kind of find evidence. Hmm. Uh, and then the you know you end up with a kind of kangaroo court where they think they've found who it is or whatever. You know, all sorts of ideas you could. Yeah, play. yeah, yeah. Because they know there's not going to be any official justice. They have to deal with yeah. it themselves. Yeah, but I think I think that's it. I think you know. Not to disrespect James DeMonaco, but I think the way you make the purge good is get rid of him. <laughs> get, get some good writers. <laughs> yeah. or, or perhaps... I don't think he's bad. Well, no, it's not that bad. It's just I think you could make great films with this premise. Yeah. And that's obviously never going to be how it operates. You, they're not going to be as marketable or what have you. But you could do it. I think you have to get rid of James DeMonaco to do that. Or at least, you know, put put him in a back seat. And... But then to give him credit, you know, I, what I imagine, it, I, I imagine these scripts are not things that he's slaved over for years. You know, I imagine he's turned them out over two weeks and just kind of <laughs> done a very, you know, good professional writing job of just churning something out to meet a deadline and make money. So he's probably a... How dare you besmirch the good name? I'm not. I'm saying. I'm saying he's probably actually a very good 
like workman writer and i'm probably not being fair by judging his stuff at the standards of like you know someone who would have spent years honing the script because you know the the purge anarchy i mean how quickly there's a year from one film coming out to the next so he can't spend that long writing it (laughs) i'll get kevin smith to do one (laughs) god But you know, you know that would be that would be all about Jay and Silent Bob like getting a huge load of pot because it's legal during the purge, and then someone tells them it's been legalized now at the end, and they're like, "What?" <laughs> and then <laughs> that's the whole joke. That's, that's probably too good. <laughs> <laughs> Where are the dancing Nazi sausages? <laughs> well, there you go, purge. Yeah, good stuff. I'm I'm glad to have finally seen these. This was really fun and worthwhile. I got a lot more out of it than I expected. I'll I'll give you mm. that. Yeah. So yeah, that's that done. Next, we don't know because <laughs> we don't know when this episode's going out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, can't wait for. Uh, um, can't wait to do Shawshank Redemption next week, tying into. The surprise release of Shawshank Redemption 2. (laughs) (laughs) Who saw that coming? It's time to get redeemed. Yeah. And then the week after that, I think No Time to Die is finally being released. So (laughs) look forward to. (laughs) Purge you later. (laughs) Okay.